All right, guys. My name's Eric. Um, I'm an Ember JS core team member. I've been working on Ember since the very early days of it being Sprout Core 2. Um, I stopped Yehuda after a uh, talk that he did talking about data binding and templates and stuff, and I was like, oh my god, I'm a, I'm a uh, struggling Rails developer trying to write JavaScript. Please help me. Um, and uh, several months later, they released uh, this proper 2 Alpha 1, and I've been on board ever since. So tonight I want to, I'm not going to give a super technical talk. I kind of just want to, I haven't, I've done a lot of technical talks. I haven't really given a uh, philosophical or a selling vision type talk. And uh, so tonight's my first attempt at doing that. So uh, I apologize if you were looking for lots of code on slides and in-depth technical discussion. You unfortunately are not going to get that from me tonight. But if you invite me back, perhaps I will talk about more technical things next time. So um, my talk is titled Ember.js Rise of Clients. And uh, Basically, it's going, I'm going to take you through a journey in which I think uh, how the web is moving, uh, what, how, how web technology is, is uh, moving forward. And uh, it actually starts with a story about one of my best friends. Uh, he started, he, he took a programming class with me back in high school. We were like doing like Pascal and I don't know, making silly, you know, CLI type games and stuff like that. And uh, we were both really into computers, but I kind of kept going on with it, and he turned into a theater nerd. And uh, so much so that he eventually turned into, he ended up studying clowning. And uh, this is my friend Alex right here. Um, and uh, he recently started getting interested again in, in uh, programming and was like, hey, I want to learn how to do web development. How should I do that? And so, I'm curious, how would you guys recommend your friends that are not technical learning how to get into web development? Right? I mean, the obvious answer is there's a ton of awesome resources on the internet for learning HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? And brace yourselves, if you Google for these things, you will find W3 schools. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, everybody loves to talk shit about W3 schools, but it's actually not terrible. They, 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 do, they do a good job. They've got some, you know, they were certainly like one of the first websites, I think. Like, just thinking back to when I was like a teenager or something, Googling for, you know, HTML and CSS shit, there was W3 schools, and it was one of the few resources, I think, back in the day. So. W3 schools, what do they recommend? What's the first thing that you should learn to do web development? Well, obviously, HTML and CSS, right? And would you, what do you know? It's the first thing on the sidebar, HTML, CSS, great. So my friend Alex, he's started, he's, well, HTML's easy, right? It's just understand that there's tags, they surround text, awesome. CSS comes in. That's how you make the tags look pretty, right? Well, how do I make my web page do something? Well, the answer is shit. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, okay. All right, so there we go. Uh, so after HTML CSS, you learn some jQuery, and hopefully you learn JavaScript too. Uh, and uh, great, you can do really awesome things, right? jQuery is super easy to get event handler set up uh, on your, your HTML. You can dynamically modify, you know, the CSS to, you can animate things. It's awesome, right? And what do you know? That's the second thing that W3 School suggests. So, now what though? Well, my friend came to me, he said, Eric, I've, I've learned some HTML and some CSS. I'm going to redo my computer notes. Um, so looking at all these tutorial sites, it seems like the next thing I should learn 
Come on. Come on. PHP. <laughs> what do you think? Um, so I think, and again, right, W3, W3 schools, they haven't updated their web page, but learn PHP is the number one thing next. So my question for you is, is that still the right path today? Can I get a vote of hands? Who thinks it's the right path today versus not being the right path today? Up to the PHP. Okay, so, so minus PHP, substitute your favorite backend technology. Who thinks that after learning HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, somebody who's you know, not deep dived in those things, but has familiarized themselves with them, should now immediately move to a backend technology? All right, we got one person. Everybody else is very shy and doesn't want to admit how they really think. But I will posit that I don't think that is true anymore. I do not think that new people learning web development today should be told, hey, great, you've got, you've got HTML, you've got CSS, you've got JavaScript. Now, here's Ruby or Rails, here's PHP, here's Python. I don't think that's the case anymore. So why do people suggest PHP? or insert your favorite backend technology, right? Well, obviously, years ago, it was the easiest way to generate dynamic HTML, right? You want, you've got, eventually you're gonna have, you know, data entry, you're gonna put that data in a database, you're gonna wanna get that data out of the database and display a web page with it, and the way that we did that in the past was, you know, to write some amazing PHP code that was interspersed between our HTML and would we throw our loops in there and just run some database queries and boom, right out. And hopefully no SQL injection uh, security risks. So, but I don't think this is the way we should be doing things anymore. I don't think this is the progression that people should take. Um, and it's actually really an amazing thing that we're able to have the luxury of not having to uh, you know, not having new developers have to learn backend right away just to do simple things like take my HTML and loop over it, stuff like this, right? So today, luckily, insert sales pitch, we've got Ember.js and the rise of the clients. I forgot to plug in the audio, so. Audio tag, why are you failing me? There we go. <laughs> all right. That took more time than all of my slides. Uh, <laughs> so, <coughs> JavaScript MVC frameworks. Are uh, excuse me. That is so annoying. So, um, I hope what I'm saying is not controversial. Uh, hopefully you guys are all on the same page, but if it is controversial, please feel free to find me later. I will buy you a drink. Hopefully we can find a bar around here, although this is the state of Washington, so I'm not sure that alcohol is served past nine o'clock. Um, but, all right, just cost double, all right. Good. Unless you drink at Costco, in which it will be cheaper for some reason. Um, so, Utah. It's not Utah. All right, no, <laughs> you're right. It's not. The Mormon population is much lower. So yes. Um, so JavaScript MVC frameworks have changed things, right? I would say backends should just be API servers. No more generating strings of HTML and shipping them down the wire to your client. And why is this a good thing? Well, obviously. Uh, there's, a few, there's a few great things about this. One, you only have to worry about sending your data from the server to the client. And your data tends to be a lot less bytes than the HTML wrapped version of your data, right? So your, uh, your server is going to respond faster, the data is going to transfer faster from the server to your client, um, and there's going to be, and also, once you send the data to your client, 
you can choose to cache it there. And so when you leave a page and come back, if you already have the data cached, you don't have to actually go to the server to get that data again, right? It's really a no-brainer. Uh, just treat your web app like you would an iOS or Android app, right? That's all it comes down to. <coughs> I really think that this is a, it's definitely a mind shift, right? Like, those of us who, that have been doing web development for years, this is a new thing. Uh, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's only going to get more prevalent. And uh, the great thing about this movement is that I think it's actually easier to build an Ember application today than it's ever been to build an Ember uh, to build a Rails application. And really, if you think about it, the reason that's true at a most foundational level, like yes, Ember can be hard to learn, but have you tried installing Ruby on Windows and getting all your gems installed and blah, 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 blah. Ember is simply a JavaScript file you download, you get some bootstrap HTML, you load it up in your browser, you're off building your app. The amount of code it takes to get up and running with Ember easily keeps it on a slide. This is the bootstrap. Require jQuery, require handlebars, require Ember. Throw in a script tag with the type text slash x handlebars. That's going to be rendered automatically upon DOM ready. And you set up your app name space. That's all you need to do. And if you didn't know, you can start building an Ember application without a backend. So things like routing. We've got client side routing. We've got a great declarative router API now very similar to you know, what you would see in Rails or other comparable frameworks. You just declare what your routes are. The great thing is this stop resource users. Without doing anything else, if you go to slash users now in your web browser, you're going to automatically get your users template rendered for you. That's all you had to do was just say users exist. You go to that URL, it's rendering that user's template. You can do nested routes. You have posts, you have a show and an edit action. Same rules apply. The URLs automatically get wired up. There's a convention for what templates will get rendered. It's all, all the hard work's done for you. There's also some great, like, I, I, I don't have these examples in the slides, but there's a link to helper. Basically, uh, I think it's an amazing, Ember's an amazing uh, way for non-public <coughs> users such as designers who know HTML, CSS, and want to put together prototypes of like an interactive application that like, you know, as you click a tab or a link, it goes to another page. In Ember, all that it takes is using the link to a handlebars helper, you can name the route, and boom, you can, you can click that link, you'll go, to, and it'll just, the app will render the, the template that you've linked to automatically. That's all you have to do. Ember data and the fixture adapter. Like I said, you don't need a backend. You can define your models on the client side. This is just a simple example, like employees, they have a name and a goal, string and number, and then they have a has many relationship to WANs, and WANs are just another model with a simple weight property. You can define fixtures client side. So without a backend, you can start building your Ember application, give it data, you can have data get input uh, from within the application, and it'll be kept in memory as long as your browser session exists. And obviously, if you refresh, any new data that you've entered will get erased. But there's also a local storage adapter that you can use, too. So you could actually use the local storage capability of your browser as a database and start building an application without a backend. So really, in my mind, prototyping has never been easier than with Ember. You throw together the HTML, CSS. If you're a designer, you can very easily stitch together a prototype application. If you're a developer, you can start doing all the work you would be anyways, even if you, without a backend, right? So what I want you guys to leave with today is that I think it needs to be easier to build web applications with user experiences that are competitive with native apps. That's really, you know, the web has gotten its ass kicked in the last several years. Basically, iOS came out, the iPhone came out, 
and it changed the game and it raised customers and users' expectations about what an, what an, what software should be like, right? We've seen a lot of innovative design and development around the mobile world. And now, the web has to compete with that. Whether it be mobile web, desktop web, whatever. Everybody's expectations have been uh, raised. And we're doing our best to th rethink how web apps are architected and making all of our lives easier, right? We want to make it easier for you to develop awesome applications that can do things that you never would have been able to do on your own before. And doing that all client side, doing that with it. being able to build your prototypes without a server, being able to throw in you know, an adapter that will talk to different types of servers. So if you choose to move from a relational database to a document-oriented database or vice versa, you want to use parse, you want to use you know, whatever back-end service that you, care, that, you, that you want. The idea is Ember's built to be agnostic to those back-ends and you know, we're, we're really just trying our best to, to uh, enable the web to be more competitive with native experiences. And you can trust that Ember is going to continue to improve and we're going to keep helping try to move the web forward. And We'd love to have your help. 1.0 RC2 is getting dropped tomorrow, I think. Hopefully. Awesome. <coughs> um, side project. I am working on Ember Casts. Uh, it is coming soon, hopefully within a matter of weeks. <coughs> Wait, what's up? So, what are the big changes that are going to be in RC2? That we uh, basically, it's just a, so there's not a lot of big changes. That's right. the point about the 1.0 RCs. The API is stable. It's all bug fixes from here on out. So RC2 is just a bunch of bug fixes. So um, I'm working on Embercast. I announced it a few days ago. Um, basically, the TLDR about Embercast is that uh, I grew up. You know, the, the majority of my professional programming career was in the Rails community, and we. And the Rails community is really lucky to have guys like Ryan Bates and uh, Jeffrey Grossenbach creating awesome screencasts and helping people come up the learning curve that is Rails. <coughs> and uh, we don't, we've had a lot of great people put together screencasts on Ember. And I think the thing that's missing is coordination across all those people. And uh, I have registered Embercast.com forever ago, and uh, I just haven't had the time to actually do produce screencasts myself. But it occurred to me that hey, perhaps what really needs to happen is just some coordination across all these people that are developing these screencasts. And so I got all the everyone that I knew in the community that was building screen that was doing screencasts, and I said, hey guys, let's work together, let's coordinate so that we're not duplicating effort. And um, you know, let's call this thing this thing Embercast. We're gonna just put out free content. You know, if we eventually have the you know money starts appearing, I will. The content creators will get the money. Like, the money's not really the thing here. We just want. I just want to make sure that people can learn how to use Ember. And you know, some people are gonna love reading source. Some people are gonna love reading docs. There's a lot of people that want to watch instructional screencasts, and uh, I certainly got a lot out of that when I was learning Rails, and I want to see that happen for the other community. So, hopefully, in a few weeks, we'll be launching Embercast. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, yeah, so thanks. Again, I'm Eric. You can follow me on Twitter. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out either on Twitter or via email. I totally love helping people learn Ember, and if you're struggling, please feel free to reach out.